Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Serge Patar. I am the deputy director of the UCL Space Domain. And today we uh, have a new lecture of our one o'clock uh, series, uh, who will deal with a, a new topic, who will be presented by uh, Rob Braham. And the title is, Can You Hear Me? Over Time Delayed Communication and, in, and human health in deep space. Uh, Bob Brahan is uh, the um, director and co-founder of Braided Communications Limited. Before um, Rob makes his presentation, I'd like to say a few words uh, about, uh, about Rob. Uh, Rob is an, ast an astrophysicist by training. He completed his uh, degree from Newcastle Universities and then he moved to commercial leadership positions across the telecoms technology sector nationally and internationally, becoming a specialist of effective commercial exploitation of innovative technologies. Um, during that period, he also successfully set up, grew and then sold his first business, one of the UK's first conference call and well conferencing I'm sorry, and, uh, and web conferencing companies. Moving into the uh, digital health, he gained expertise in physical and mental health care before co-founding Braided Communications. Braided was created to solve a seemingly unsolvable problem. I think we're going to hear a lot about it during the talk. How can astronauts future deep space missions communication communicate effectively with Earth despite the distance and of course the induced latency. The solution proposed, space braiding, is now the subject of uh, three research projects which are funded by uh, respectively by NASA, ESA and the UK uh, Space Agency aiming to validate the efficacy of this tool in operational and personal communications. Uh, the, 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 the knowledge uh, gained by this tool has also been now transferred <coughs> to uh, adapt and to be adapted and to create meetings uh, uh, on Earth with uh, developing collaborative meetings. So uh, I think this technology looks uh, absolutely full of promises and we're very eager to hear about it right now. So uh, Rob, the floor is now yours. You have about, say, 40 minutes for your uh, formal presentation, and usually we have between 15 and 20 minutes for a Q&A uh, with the audience. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak this afternoon. Um, so, yeah, my name is Rob Braun, um, and as Sir just said, I'm co-founder uh, of a company called Braided Communications. Uh, as Sir just mentioned, um, uh, I've got a degree in astrophysics and spent many years in industry, both in communications and in digital healthcare. Uh, my co-founder, Drew Smith-Simmons, is a clinical psychotherapist, and he's also an expert in digital healthcare. Um, so we want to talk today uh, about what I'm going to call a hidden hazard of human missions to deep space. Uh, I'll be talking about how that hidden hazard represents potentially a fantastic opportunity for some innovative and valuable space domain research, research where actually the UK is very well positioned to take a leading position going forwards. I'll also be talking about how at Braid we've created a solution to a, a problem in this field that was previously considered impossible to solve and about how we're building a business around that invention. So what do I mean by deep space? That's the first thing to cover. Well, Deep space means beyond low Earth orbit. So for now, that means the planned missions back to the moon and then on to Mars. Now, and there are, when we go into deep space, in simple terms, three significant hazards to human health associated with deep space. And they're as follows. Uh, number one is microgravity. How will the human body react to extended periods in microgravity? Number two is radiation. How will the human body react to extended exposure to, to high levels of radiation. And number three is isolation. How will the humans cope once isolated? Those are basically the hardest parts of any future mission into deep space. So for getting to Mars, pretty much everything else is really just simple rocket engineering and logistics. Um, so which one of those is a hidden hazard and, and why is it hidden? 
Well, the clue, of course, is in the title of the presentation, as shown on this slide. Um, it's an enormous hidden hazard within isolation. The crew on future deep space missions won't just be isolated. They'll be isolated a very, very long way from home. Uh, and being isolated that far away has a huge impact on communication back to Earth. Now, I know I have pretty much the most expert audience possible here uh, for this, but for those of you who are perhaps not physicists or astrophysicists, I am going to talk about that delay in a little more detail to give you the context. And even for those of you who are experts, I, I guarantee that unless you've actively sat down and thought about this specific challenge, some of what I'm going to say in the next few moments is going to surprise you. So communication to and from spaceships is currently via radio. In future, perhaps we might use lasers, but both are, of course, electromagnetic waves. And so they travel at the speed of light, uh, about 300,000 kilometers per second. And at that speed, you can travel all the way around the world seven and a half times in a single second. But the distances in space are vast. They're so vast that even with signals traveling at the speed of light, delays are going to occur. And those delays are going to have significant consequences for future crewed missions. <clears throat> so now we all know, of course, that it's possible to communicate with people in space. It happens all the time today on the ISS. But the ISS orbits at an altitude of just about 400 kilometres. That's about the same distance as London to, to my old university, Newcastle. And the signal takes just over a thousandth of a second to make the journey. So there's no perceivable delay for people on the ISS. The furthest that humans have traveled into space so far is the moon. It's a lot further away than the ISS. It's about 384,000 kilometers away. And the delay is about 1.3 seconds each way. Now that's awkward, but it's still imperfectly possible to have a conversation as the Apollo missions proved. All you need to do is have a little discipline to wait briefly for a reply and, and perhaps some guiding protocols such as use of the word over when you finish speaking. Um, there's also going to be other communication challenges when we go back to the moon during the forthcoming Artemis missions. There's going to be outages, so those are going to compound the latency. So some of those outages are going to be predictable as the various communication satellites rotate and move. Uh, they're going to go in and out of line of sight. Some are going to be unpredictable as uh, caused by events such as interference from solar activity. Now, you probably know that the plan with Artemis is for crews to be on or near the moon for much longer than the Apollo missions. So the crew's going to have to learn how to live within that new communication environment. That might cause unexpected issues, but because the moon's relatively close, the journey home can be completed in just a few days. So if the communication challenges cause any currently unanticipated operational health issues, then the crew can come home quickly. When we consider a possible trip to Mars, though, things get much, much more challenging, and that's because Mars is much, much further away. At its very closest position, Mars is over 150 times further away than the Moon. At its most distant, it's more than a thousand times further away. So a journey to Mars and, and back is going to take many months. The shortest possible mission duration is about 15 months. Now, that only gives the crew about a month on the surface. If you want longer on the surface, which you might do because you've traveled a long way, then you're actually going to need to extend the mission to about 30 months because you need to wait for a return launch window, which I'll explain a little later. And during those missions, the crew is going to be exposed to high latency throughout. The latency is going to vary continuously as Earth and Mars move in their respective orbits. And depending on the mission profile, it might exceed 20 minutes one way. So that's over 40 minutes to wait for a reply in any conversation. So latency such as that is inevitably going to have operational consequences for the mission. And it's also going to have health consequences. And those health consequences, which are currently little understood because there's been almost no research in this area, are critical because, of course, for a crewed mission to Mars, you're only going to have success if you can keep the crew healthy to the planet, on the planet and back again. Now, this latency is entirely unavoidable. And I'm sure you'll understand it's down to a basic law of physics. The speed of light cannot be exceeded. And so this has been well understood since the days of Einstein. So why then is it described as a hidden hazard? Well, there are two key reasons for that, both of which I think are very, very interesting. First reason is simply that it's little thought about and little understood, certainly compared to the other two hazards that I mentioned earlier. And it's because I think compared to the other two, it's just a little bit harder to comprehend. So we've all seen films, both factual and 
astronauts float around in microgravity. And so intuitively, we all understand that that happens. Radiation is quite widely understood too, from many points of view, for example, nuclear power industry, use in medical radiotherapy. And you can even see radiation or rather its impact if you're lucky enough to see the Aurora Borealis or the Aurora Australis. And actually every mission to the ISS generates lots of new data about both issues. And in contrast, latency is little understood and little studied. And it's not exactly complicated, but it's just not something you'll ever have experienced, even if you do happen to be an astronaut. So it's just not easy to get your head around it. We've all evolved over millions of years in an environment where latency is effectively zero. And even today, where some people are watching this live stream, possibly thousands of miles away, the latency is effectively zero because my voice is being carried on by light on fiber optic cable. And we're all hardwired to expect zero latency. So rather than saying it's kind of hard to comprehend, it's probably better to say it's strange to comprehend. And I know that most of you listening today will fully understand the core concepts. But as I said earlier, unless you've actively sat down and thought about this, you won't understand some of the consequences. So that's one reason why it's a hidden hazard. The second reason is that basic law of physics thing. Even when it's been thought about, an obvious conclusion is, well, we can't change the speed of light, so surely there's nothing we can do about latency. I mean, we can begin to mitigate microgravity and radiation, perhaps through shielding or exercise or medicine, but we can't fix latency, so why worry? We're just gonna have to learn to live with it. That's where braiding came along and changed things. Obviously, we also can't change the laws of physics, otherwise I'd be giving a very different lecture today. Uh, but we realized that humans are very adaptable in their approach to communication. And we invented a way to structure communication so it feels to two people as if they're having a normal conversation despite the latency. And that could have some really important benefits. And that's why it's now the subject of the three studies that Serge mentioned earlier, funded respectively by NASA, the European Space Agency and the UK Space Agency. And for one of those studies, the UK Space Agency, we're delighted to be working with two UCL academics Professor Mark Huckvale and from the UCL space domain, Dr. Ia Whiteley. So I want to help you understand that strangeness of um, that strangeness of, of latency a little bit more. So I'm going to play you an animation of a potential future mission to Mars and show you the latency it generates. So this is a schematic of the inner solar system, and it shows the relative positions of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars on the 10th of June 2035, which is a possible future launch date for a mission. So this is where the planets will be on that day. And when I press play, you'll see the planets start to move. And you'll also see another dot appear, which shows the position of a ship traveling to Mars and back. So if we can be ready for a mission in 13 years time, this is the journey that we could possibly take. Let me just point out a couple of general things before I start the animation. And again, I know that most of you listening are gonna know all of this already, but perhaps not all of you. So when it starts, you'll notice that everything is always moving. Broadly speaking, everything is going around the sun in slightly different curves. That means our rocket doesn't just fly straight to Mars and back again. Instead, it flies on a curved path aiming to intercept the orbit of Mars at a particular point in future where Mars is gonna be at the same place. Now, there aren't many times when that's possible. That's why you hear the phrase launch window. This particular date, 10th of June, 2035, is a viable launch window. The next one after that won't be for more than two years. And once you've pressed go and ignited the rocket engine to start the journey, you can't just turn around and come back again if you need to. Ship for that first trip to Mars is almost certainly going to be assembled in orbit around the Earth. Once everything's ready and some lucky person does get the chance to press go, the rocket engine is probably only going to burn for a couple of minutes. But once it's done so, that's it. You're going to Mars and you're not coming back for a long time. Another general rule is that the closer the sun something is, the faster it moves. It's not just that orbits in, in close in are smaller, the actual velocities are higher too. Now the thing that drives latency is the distance between Earth and the ship. Radio waves can move in a straight line, pretty much. So if you can measure the distance between Earth and ship, you can calculate the latency. So let's start the animation and go to Mars. You can see here initially the ship, the green dots, moving fast relative to the sun, but it's moving more or less parallel to the Earth. So you might imagine the latency is not increasing enormously quickly, and you'd be right. Then we approach Mars and Earth is beginning to curve away, so the latency is increasing more quickly. We're going to land on Mars, and then after just a month or so on the surface, we're going to take off again and begin our journey back to Earth. 
At that stage, we're near Mars, a long way from the sun, and we're moving quite slowly. Earth is moving away from us at that point, and as it's closer to the sun than we are, it's moving fast. So at that point, the separation and therefore the latency is still increasing. You will then see that we're going to start to dive through the inner solar system and begin to move faster and faster and begin to catch up with Earth again. And so latency is going to start to decrease. And then we land back on Earth and the latency is back to zero. So that is a real future potential trip to Mars. I just want to share a few points about this before I move on. First, launch windows. If we hadn't taken off for Mars when we did, we'd have had to wait at least another Earth year on Mars to be able to get back again and have another launch window. Secondly, that profile I just showed you is certainly possible from an orbital mechanics point of view if we launch in 2035. But no human will be going on that journey exactly like that in the near future because the return goes way too close to the sun to survive. As you will have noticed, it was almost as close to the sun as Mercury, so the crew would have been cooked. Uh, we're going to need to find a different profile that doesn't go quite so close to the sun, but actually the latency profile will still be very similar to this one. So this slide shows you that latency curve for that mission profile you just saw in red. And also for comparison, shows you another one for a long stay mission uh, in which the crew does stay on the surface for over a year in blue. The vertical lines in each case show the arrival and departure dates from Mars. So I'm going to talk briefly about the red line, and that's the one which you just saw the animation for. You can see at the beginning that uh, initial period where the latency only grows relatively slowly and you can see how it starts to grow more quickly as the ship approaches Mars and you'll recall the Earth begins to curve away. You can see how latency continues to increase while the crew is on the surface of Mars and also continues to increase as they begin their journey home. It's not until about halfway through the journey home that the latency begins to decrease again. So I'm going to put a few numbers on that for you. So the crew leaves Earth on day zero and of course latency is zero. They land on Mars on day 186, at which point the latency is seven minutes and 14 seconds one way. Now that is a lot, especially when you bear in mind that the highest latency any human has ever experienced on a real mission so far has been 1.3 seconds. So our Mars crew on landing is gonna be 333 times further away from the Earth than the Apollo crews were. This crew leaves Mars on day 216, by which time the latency has grown to 9 minutes and 28 seconds. And think about that for a while. You're trying to have a normal conversation with Earth. You're waiting 19 minutes for every single response. On the way home, the latency grows to a peak of 14 minutes, 31 seconds on day 311. Now, that's pretty challenging. It's 29 minutes to wait for a reply to any question. No one's ever experienced that. But it's actually a lot less challenging than if the crew was on the other long stay profile that you can see in blue. In that profile, the crew would spend over a year living at latencies above 15 minutes. And that latency for them would peak at well over 20 minutes. So back to our crew on the red line, they're returning to Earth and on day 470, they land back on Earth and the latency reaches zero again. You can see, I mentioned on the slope of the graph varies and that shows that the uh, rate of change of latency varies a lot too. So for example, just after leaving Mars, the latency is for a week or two actually growing by about 10 seconds each day. Now, I've mentioned before, um, but it bears mentioning again, that there's very little research into latency. And in part, we think this is because until we came along, there was no potential mitigators to consider in experiments. But even without the research that, that we wish had happened already, um, just based on this one graph, there are some obvious questions which emerge, which must be answered before we um, can possibly consider that first mission. I'm sure you can think of a bunch of them yourself already. Some of them are initially, the crew can simply use normal voice conversation for everything. Somewhere along that journey, that's gonna become impossible and they're gonna need to use alternatives. But how far? And does that vary for different types of calls? You know, operational calls with mission control versus personal calls with family or medical calls with the flight surgeon. No one's ever studied that at all before. We're actually planning to do the first study soon ourselves, but that's only just going to begin to scratch the surface. And how will the mission handle any urgent or emergency discussions? You know, we know the crew is going to need to be way more autonomous than lunar missions. But if there is a scenario that requires ground input, what happens? How will the crew feel if they're unable to talk properly with their loved ones. You know, think about that for a minute. If you're a crew member on that first mission to Mars, it's the most exciting and also the scariest thing you'll certainly ever do in your life. You really want to talk with the most important people in your life, but you simply can't. 
And remember that change in latency of 10 seconds in one day? You've left Mars. You are ostensibly on your way home. And yet the distance to Earth is increasing so fast that you're nearly eight Earth-Moon distances further away from home this afternoon than you were yesterday afternoon. What's that going to do to the morale of the crew and the motivation of the crew? And how are their family on Earth going to feel? And also remember that peak latency of 14 and a half minutes. And then the other profile you can see in blue with the crew having to live for over a year with a latency of more than 15 minutes. Perhaps we're going to find out that the impact of latency is so serious, either operationally or health-wise or both, that we're going to need to be planning for these shorter mission durations only. Now, a fair question at this point would be, what health impact? Right? You know, once you understand the concept of latency, it's pretty obvious there are going to be operational impacts. For example, I mentioned earlier on urgent operation issues. Now, how might a crew in deep space perform some kind of urgent or emergency process for which today on the ISS, they'd rely on real time discussion with an expert on the ground. But can latency really affect health? Well, it can and it will, although we don't even know a fraction of, of the details of how yet. One thing we do know is that latency is gonna impact on the ability of flight surgeons to have private medical conferences with the astronauts. This, these calls happen today, um, they're every week for each astronaut and they're a critical part of each mission. So they're challenging enough today with the outages and the communication interference of the ISS. How effective can they be once we've lost the ability to have voice communication? Much more profound um, is the likely impact of the crew um, on, on the crew of emotional isolation. Isolation is challenging, but isolation in high latency situations is much worse because humans are inherently social animals. When someone is isolated, in the sense of being separated from their important relationships, this sets off a, a biological alarm in the body. The body senses danger and essentially goes into fight or flight mode. Now, when latency is low, the isolated person can pick up the phone or set up a video call, share a moment of togetherness with someone close and important to them, and that helps to dampen down that biological alarm. But if latency is high and there's no opportunity to connect with someone, that alarm is not dampened. And prolonged activation of that alarm can have severe effects. It's associated with many psychological and physiological issues, including depression, anxiety, immune system disorders, cardiac disorders, and sleep problems. It's also associated with increased inflammation. And recent research indicates that increased inflammation reduces the body's ability to cope with other risk factors, the microgravity and the radiation that I mentioned before. So it's likely that latency isn't just going to be a challenge in and of itself from a health point of view. It may well also amplify the impact of the other hazards. Now, if this all sounds a little bit vague, it's because in many ways it is. Again, as I've said before, there's been very little research yet on the impact of latency. Now, that is going to change. It's going to have to if we're ever going to get a, a seriously plan a Mars mission. Uh, so I think there's going to be many more opportunities for high latency research, both health related and operationally related in the years ahead. There's actually a very interesting parallel here in, with research into um, artificial gravity for missions and something called SANS, which is space flight acquired neuroocular syndrome. So back in the 50s and 60s and space flight was much, uh, much newer, there was a lot of research into artificial gravity for space flight. It was basically assumed at that point that prolonged exposure to microgravity would be so damaging to crew that they'd need an onboard centrifuge in order to remain healthy. However, as missions extended in duration through the Mir and the Skylab years, people returned to Earth and they were certainly impacted. They were taller, they were weaker, they had reduced bone density. But in general, everything gradually recovered once they were back on Earth. So at that point, all the research into artificial gravity was stopped. Then about a dozen years or so ago, SANS was identified. What it means in simple terms is that prolonged exposure to microgravity appears to damage vision in ways that do not reverse when the crew returns to Earth. So now there's a lot of research in this area to try to find out what triggers sounds and how it might be mitigated, including perhaps via artificial gravity. So all that research has restarted and there's some really interesting things emerging. One I'm really interested in myself is, uh, is something called gravity gradients. If we're gonna put a centrifuge on a ship, it's going to need to be small. Um, that means that possibly the astronaut's head might be in one G, but their feet might be in a half G. So they've got a gravity gradient, which again is something new. How is that going to uh, um, impact on the crew? Is it better or worse than zero G? Now, latency is just as unavoidable on a trip to Mars as microgravity is. 
and it will have significant consequences. It is, I think, highly likely that at some point soon, latency will identify its own sound moment, and I'm personally convinced that it will be associated with the psychological impact on the crew and how that manifests itself in other ways. So before launch, we as a space community need to understand this hidden hazard in much more depth, including the impact of latency on operations and crew health and how to mitigate that impact much, much better. Now, interestingly, this is a, a field of research where the UK seems very well positioned to contribute. In addition to our, our national academic strengths, we have significant expertise in space communications and healthcare research, both psychological and physiological. And there are actually some moves underway at present to create a, a special interest group to explore how we as a community might work more deeply in this field across the UK. So if anyone's interested, please get in touch afterwards and I'll, I'll connect you into those conversations. Um, one point, finally, point to make here is that even though latency research is far behind other hazards, there is one very powerful ace up our mutual sleeve. And that is that uh, of the three hazards I mentioned earlier, this is the only one that can be easily and ethically studied on the ground. You know, we can't really simulate microgravity too well and deliberately exposing people to radiation experiments is simply not an option, but we can do latency experiments on the ground. Analog environments already exist within which volunteers can be isolated within a ship-like or a Mars-like environment. And adding a latency element to those studies is absolutely possible. It's already been done a little. And in fact, we did ourselves do that with a volunteer crew at a, a place called the Mars Desert Research Station for two weeks in January. I think there's going to be a lot more research in this area, including um, uh, both health and operational going forward. So again, if people are interested, please do, uh, please do let me know. So I've spent a long time telling you what a huge challenge latency is. And I've also mentioned that I think we have a tool, we think we have a tool to address the problem. So hopefully if I haven't lost you all yet as an audience, you're all gonna to wanna to know how braiding works. So this is how it works. Uh, first thing to say is that all sessions are set up in advance. They have to be. If you're five light minutes away from me, I can't just call you when I feel like it because it's gonna take five minutes for your phone to ring and then five more minutes for me to hear you say hello. So we schedule and plan all the sessions in advance and we agree ahead of time what the topics of braids are gonna be. Those braids are arranged on a carousel, as you can see here, um, and that rotates between us. Um, and we're both in the same carousel, we're both in the shared conversation. You just saw the carousel rotate in the video there. And it's really important that we both know we're in the same carousel for some of the psychological benefits I, uh, I shared earlier. Uh, it's just that we happen to be on opposite sides of the carousel. Excuse me. Um, so the content is typed, as you can see. We probably will deploy audio and video versions in future, but there are actually a number of very good reasons why typing is better. And the timing is arranged carefully so that the content on one or more braids is traveling across the latency whilst each person is typing in a different braid. With some smart design and some clever underlying structures, that means that every time the carousel rotates one step, each person gets fresh content from the other to which they can respond and in this way, the conversation builds across all the braids. So this is probably a lot more simple than you expected. I'm sure some of you are thinking, is that it, really? Well, yes, that is it. And I like to think of it as a simple but non-obvious idea. It absolutely is a simple but non-obvious idea. It was actually invented by my co-founder, Drew. And when he first told me, I remember stepping back and saying, that's absolute genius. Those simple ideas are often the most powerful ideas. They have to be simple because it has to be used. And remember, some of the people using this in future are gonna be astronauts, friends, and family. They're not all gonna be highly trained mission controllers. Obviously to deliver that front end and simplicity required a lot of back end complexity and detail, but the tool is now fully working. And as you heard earlier, it's already in use in multiple research projects. In addition to the research studies, we've also done um, demos and tests with space professionals, including other academics and flight surgeons, mission controllers, and also astronauts. And the overwhelming feedback has been that it works. It gives the feeling of being in a real and natural conversation in a way that was not previously considered possible. In order to do some of the research we've done, we're currently and we're currently doing, we also needed to build a second tool, of course, we needed the control case study. You know, you obviously the control and experiments and before braiding came along, Everyone assumed that email would be used a lot, but they felt that the obvious communication tool for a, a real time, as near as possible discussion, would be the equivalent of text messages with time delay. Now that doesn't exist as a product in the commercial world, so we had to build our own version. And we've successfully done that and we use it with your UCL colleagues in the UK Space Agency study. So that means we actually have a full suite of research tools available off the shelf. So if any of you do want to get involved in 
high latency research going forward. We have both the experiment and control condition available, um, easily available to, to be deployed in studies. So that's everything about space braiding, but I also want to talk a bit about braided meetings because I was asked to include in my talk today a little bit about the business side. I understand that uh, many of the UCL students, I'm not sure how many students are actually on this lecture, but many are very interested in the entrepreneurial opportunities of space. And so I wanted to include some entrepreneurial lessons. Now, as a business, when we first started on this journey, one of the first questions we got, quite rightly, was how are you ever going to make any money? Uh, and we were pretty certain we'd get some research funding, as indeed we have, and we hope that as the research evolves, Braden's going to become to be seen as kind of a core component of communication or future missions. Uh, and so it's going to be purchased as a core component on top of which analog and real missions will build further knowledge. So it will, we hope, become a business as usual tool with a business as usual software license fee, just like other software. But we were also pretty certain from day one that we could create a terrestrial application for Braden, and that's just what we've done. It, uh, it amuses me greatly to think of the Earth as our second market after space. Now, in space braiding, as you saw, the braiding structure in the carousel effectively repairs the fractured communication between two people separated by great distance. And we realized that the same methodology could be applied to meetings on Earth. So what we've created is a tool called braided meeting. And as you can see, it uses the same carousel structure, but because we're not limited anymore by latency, we can have one participant per braid. So as the carousel rotates, and you saw that a minute ago, it takes each topic to a new person, and that person can then see what the other people have written and add their contribution. As the carousel rotates, the discussion on each topic develops. Now, this is currently a, a brand new product. It only went live a couple of weeks ago, and I'll let you know in a minute how you can try it if you want. But just before that, I want to talk briefly about some of the business drivers here, because that's where those entrepreneurial lessons come into play. So we started as a business by developing space braiding. It was developed as a solution to a problem previously considered impossible. And as a business, that's a pretty smart thing to do. Solve a problem that no one else can solve when you have a viable business. As described before, we think we do, although we also know it's never gonna be a, a, an enormous market. But space braiding then spawned braided meetings. Now, in some way, that appears to be a solution looking for a problem. And that's generally not a smart thing to do. And to be honest, at the moment, I can't tell you hand on heart that braiding is a smart, braided meetings is a smart idea. I won't really know that until we've got loads of customers using it and loving it. And it's so new that we simply don't have that yet. But we do, I think, have a lot of things on our side. First, the market on Earth is much bigger. So we only need a small fraction of it in order to make a viable business. Um, next, developing ideas like this into fully launched products takes a lot of time and effort and money. But a lot of the work associated with developing space braiding has been reused in braided meetings. So we've significantly reduced the cost and complexity and the risk of development. Secondly, because this has clearly and obviously come out of the space sector, we've got a fantastic story to tell here. Now, this is the only business collaboration tool based on technology developed to help people get to Mars. That might be uh, standard to you guys in this call, but for the vast majority of people there, that's a great marketing PR message, and it's already generated a lot of interest. Uh, next, Braden Meetings builds on some of the other core strengths we have as a business. So this is not the first business I've created. And in fact, as Serge said in the introduction, way back in the early 2000s, I built one of the UK's first conference call and web conferencing businesses. So I've already learned some valuable lessons about taking collaboration tools to market. And that's been really helpful as we've developed this business. And also for Braden Meetings, the fact that my co-founder Drew and I are so very different has been critical. You know, not just in academic background and previous experience where the combination of psychology and astrophysics has been key to the development and success of space braiding, but also actually in personality types. On a simple introvert extrovert scale measure, I'm very much at the extrovert end of the scale and Drew is at the other end of the introvert end of the scale. Now there are strengths and weaknesses in both of course, and there are also differing preferences, particularly when it comes to interacting with other people in meetings. In general, and this is a huge generalization, so please don't take it too literally, extroverts typically enjoy the meeting format, whether it's face-to-face -face or video, but they probably talk too much. I know I do. They perhaps don't think deeply enough before talking, and sometimes they talk over others and prevent them from being heard. In contrast, introverts typically don't enjoy the current meeting format. You know, they probably talk too little, and when they do talk, if spoken over, they're likely to stop talking immediately. So this means if you have a team with a mixture of different preferences on the introvert-extrovert scale, which, by the way, if you have a team, you do because we're all different, 
then you're not getting the most valuable outcomes from your meetings. And there are also many other reasons why contributions might vary in meetings, perhaps because someone's more senior or someone considers themselves less knowledgeable or perhaps someone is defending a personal position. So this is a problem that's actually widely understood both from the point of view of meeting leaders and participants, but people just assume it can't be solved. You might get, Sue's always like that in meetings, she never shuts up. Or John's always like that in meetings, he never says a word. So at that level, we see braided meetings as being very much the same as space braiding. It's based on the same underlying methodology and it solves a problem previously considered unsolvable. And in both cases, we're leveraging skills and experiences in areas that we know and understand. Now, when you have a solution such as space braiding in a research led environment, then what you do is you start applying for grants. And that's what we've done successfully with space braiding. When you have such a solution in the commercial world as you have with braided meetings, you need to start finding use cases which will make somebody buy your product. And that's the journey we're just starting on with braided meetings. So based on feedback from early testers and trialists, we've identified some possible use cases. And don't worry, I'm not gonna cover all of them, I'm just gonna talk about the first one. You're probably all familiar with agile development methodology. Teams building new software, working in sprint cycles and delivering iterative versions of products. Now, as someone old enough to remember the days of development before Agile, I am certainly a huge fan of this approach. In most cases, after each sprint, there's a team retro meeting where the team reviews the sprint and tries to learn lessons for the future, what worked, what didn't work. Well, now you won't be hugely surprised to learn that development teams are often dominated, at least numerically, by people who tend towards the introvert end of the spectrum. But those retro meetings tend to be dominated by the small number of extroverts. So the lessons learned only reflect a small proportion of the team's experiences. With a braided meeting, all members of the team have the opportunity to contribute equally. They also have the obligation to contribute equally too, which is actually just as important. So going back to the names I had before, Sue can't interrupt John when he's trying to share an idea. Equally, John can't just divert attention by saying, I agree with Sue, and then go back to being quiet. So we then come to, to the last and by far the most important entrepreneurial lesson of today's talk. If you end up working for a small company, either one you set up yourself or if you join a startup, then your most important role is always sales. It doesn't matter what your official job title is. You might have joined straight from university as a research assistant. But that old friend from school you had met up with for a coffee yesterday or the new friend you met at yoga, they might just be a great potential customer for your company's product. Now, this doesn't mean you need to walk around with a bunch of blank order forms or something can be a really pushy salesperson. It just means knowing as much as you can about your company's products and how they solve problems. And it means listening and thinking. And if the opportunity arises to talk about how your company's product might help, then take that opportunity. Sometimes that ends up being a numbers game. You might find, you find yourself asked to present at a research conference and think about how you might subtly and without in any way taking away from the core research content of your presentation weave in a few subtle messages about value in terms of selling the product. You might find yourself in a situation I'm in here. You know, obviously you've heard in my intro introduction, I've got no academic experience, so I have no idea if there are any use cases for braided meetings in academia. And of course, I'm delivering this on Zoom from my spare room, so I can't hang out afterwards with you all and mingle and talk about what's going on here. Um, but I hope I've generated enough interest that some of you might want to give it a go and you might find some really interesting use cases in academia. If you do, please let us know. We'd obviously love to know. You can see it's very easy to sign up via our website. Very affordable, no long-term commitment, and there is a free trial option too. So if you want to give that a go uh, before buying, you can. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to talk here. I searched it earlier. I think there'll be time for Q&A now. I hope you enjoyed it. I just want to say that, um, you can follow us on Brady on LinkedIn at Brady Communications there. Feel free to get in touch via the email or the website. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rob, for this uh, talk, which is uh, I mean, very, very fascinating, especially the, the first part and uh, what you propose also the second part. Uh, a lot of, uh, I think, um, uh, possibilities or at least uh, um, willingness from different people to you know to understand better what's going on and some opening on some possible opportunities to indeed so uh, i think we enter in this uh, second segment of our uh, lecture today 
uh, meaning that the floor is open to questions. So please uh, go ahead. We'll do it, it very informally. Just uh, turn on your mic and ask uh, Rob a question. Please go ahead. I can kick things off, Mike, if you like. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, Rob. Um, what did, uh, there's a couple of things. First thing really is, uh, did they come out of Mars 500 in this area? They, they tried to simulate that sort of the latency in their um, simulated trip to Mars. Um, have you, I know that, I know that Ear was quite close to that mission and I, I, I attended the, in Moscow when I was there, but anything from that? Um, yeah, absolutely. So that's one of, uh, as I said, there have been some missions where latency has been applied. Um, so we're certainly uh, aware of the Mars 500. Um, it was, it happened pretty much before we started Braders, so we weren't actively looking at the time. There have been a couple of others as well. Um, so there's, there was one called High Seas in Hawaii, and they applied late to there as well. And in fact, we've had the, uh, the we, we've been lucky enough to be able to be introduced to some of the um, people who were um, in the High Seas habitat. Uh, and they've been able to uh, see uh, demos of braiding. And in fact, in, in a couple of cases, they've taken part in, in one of the studies, the NASA funded study. So people who've actually got lived experience of simulated latency have seen braiding and they've got some very interesting things to say. One of the, um, one of the most powerful stories is one that I was told by one of the high seas um, uh, delegates there. The delegates is the right word, residents, I don't know. Um, uh, one of the people from high seas who said that while she was in high seas, which was for her, I think about eight months, um, her relationship with her mother actually deteriorated significantly because her mother was quite old and didn't understand um, the concept of latency. So um, this, this uh, lady would write uh, long emails to her mum who would then write and say, that's nice, dear, I'm just nipping out to the shops um, and, and wouldn't actually end up with a, a sort of a, a, a robust reply. Whereas other people who she spoke to who were perhaps more aware of what was happening, they they became closer friends because they understood and they began to reply properly to those emails. But nevertheless, they were still just emails, asynchronous communication. Um, what, we, you, what we've created in, in Braid is what we call high latency synchronous. So the concept of synchrony normally is considered to be a zero latency um, deliverable, but actually with braiding, um, it's uh, something that can be delivered at high latency. And that synchrony is the important part for the psychological health of the crew. And uh, may, I, may I ask also a question echoing what just uh, Alan said? I mean, in, in, of course, there is some confidentiality, I believe, with that. Uh, in the research projects you have with uh, NASA, European Space Agency and UKSA, um, you have, um, I mean, you're studying cases uh, on the ground, mimicking really a, a Mars uh, uh, voyage, a Mars journey. And, um, starting with low latency and increasing the latency and just one first i mean testing how this works and second putting some uh, humans uh, behind the conversation and see how they behave yeah they well, they're all humans behind the conversation in all those all, all of those studies um and they're all humans on earth um, we haven't yet had the opportunity to work with people on the ISS. And as you heard earlier, the ISS latency would have to be emulated to be higher. So I've got really, can everyone hear me? I've got a really difficult echo at the moment. Okay, I'll carry on. Hopefully that's um, someone was had their uh, microphone. So, um, so we, we have volunteers involved in the studies. Um, in the NASA study, it happens to be volunteers um, in the space sector. So these are people who are, as you heard, they've already spent time in it. analogs. Um, they might be in some way associated with the space sector as an academic or a medic or, or, or whatever it might be. Uh, and that's been deliberately the case because the scenarios we're testing there are, um, are sort of realistic operational scenarios being mimicked that might be happening to a crew on a future mission. What we did with um, uh, the UK Space Agency one is, um, is uh, also simulated latency, but actually it was just using members of the public. 
Um, and so what we did there um, with your, your college UCL is we've um, had a task completion uh, activity. So pairs of, pairs of volunteers have literally been given a really simple task of they've both got a picture and they've got to spot the difference, like the kid, children spot the difference picture. Um, and it's really easy if you sat across someone on, uh, on a desk, you know, they can't see your picture, but you can say, oh, there's a beach here and uh, there's a car with a child in it. Um, and you go, oh, well, my car hasn't got a child in or whatever. Very easy to solve that. If you've got a latency that delays the delivery of those messages, it's much harder. And if that happens on a text message situation where I might say to you, um, yeah, there's a car, um, there's a ball, it's red. And you go, well, which one was red, the car or the ball? Because I haven't specified it. You then have to ask and I have to wait for that to reach me and come back. It becomes very complex. If you've got it structured in a way that braiding structures it, that's much less likely to happen, is our hypothesis at the moment. We haven't yet got the full results from that. But yeah, it's all being done with emulated latency on the ground in different scenarios. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, any other question? No, I don't see Ia on board. Uh, am I right? I think Ia is not here. No, she's not. So I know she was only available for the first half hour of this. She told me. Ah, so, um, okay. okay, she left. Okay, mm -hmm. because um, okay. Um, are there any other uh, experiments uh, in the vein of the Mars 500 who are planned uh, in the very next near, near future that you're aware of and where your technique could be tested? Um, so there are several we're aware of, and probably others we're not. So in NASA, there's a, a, a place called HERA, uh, where there's going to be a, a number of people going through analog there. Um, uh, we're not actively involved in any of those yet, but obviously we, we hope to be going forwards. Um, uh, there, there's, um, there's not many where um, latency is being talked about as a key enabler, and this comes up to that point I said earlier we need to do much more research in this area because it's unavoidable if we do want to go to Mars. You know, we are going to be experiencing that latency profile. Um, my person, personal opinion is if we're ever going to go to Mars, we need to start to do some uh, analog experiments either on the ISS or perhaps in, in Antarctica where crew are genuinely isolated and then apply high latency communication, high latency to all communications um, uh, and understand how the crew can respond to that. Yeah, of course, that's a good example. But um, for instance, I believe uh, well, we all know that uh, um, Elon Musk is, of course, planning for a Mars journey not too far down the line. Uh, is this uh, issue a concern uh, for the, the journeys he's planning? Probably it is. And are you in touch with, uh, um, I mean, his plans, with what he's doing? Uh, he knows your work or uh, it's, it's uh, an issue for the moment for this kind of uh, company? Uh, it's a, it's a, a great question. <laughs> Um, we haven't yet spoken to them. We, we do want to and we, we plan to be doing so soon. We focused initially um, on, the, um, uh, on the space agencies um, for a number of reasons. We, we, we first of all, we're, we're both scientists at, at, at heart and we wanted to make sure we began to do really robust research into this first. That's one point. Uh, second point you'll have seen on the bottom of all my slides, we were talking about pattern and design rights and things like that. And one of the things that's really important to us as a small business is the intellectual property and what we've invented and our ability over time to benefit from that. Um, uh, and then um, uh, we know that with the space agencies, they are very strong respecters of inter intellectual property. So we wanted to get as far as we could in that before we exposed ourselves to what might be a small risk, but to go, if we start talking to other companies, you need to be much more certain in your ability to protect your intellectual property. We're far enough down the journey now that we believe we are. So uh, we're going to be making those approaches um, uh, pretty soon when we have the first data out of some of our current studies. Yeah, I can imagine, and we all can imagine easily that it's a central preoccupation to the IPR is really central indeed, yes. I can understand that, okay. But they're going to be clients probably. They're going to, I mean, if their, their plans go according, uh, and if things go according to their plans, they're going to be pretty active in long distance flights. So of course it's uh, yes. certainly uh, an area to look at. Yeah. yeah. Uh, other questions? There's one I've in the chat. I've seen one in the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, I spotted it as well. 
You spot one on the chat, Alan? Yeah, I mean, I'll read it out for you. I, I, um, um, it's, it, it's from, is that Yahweh Yang? I, I, anyway, what else digital interfaces that braided communications may be applied to in the near future? What about in VR, AR team meetings? Would that be something happening? Yeah, good, good, good question. So a um, couple of points now. So uh, I mentioned briefly in, in my talk, although it was something I kind of mentioned literally briefly, so you may not have heard it, is um, the current interface for both space braiding and braided meetings is tight. There's a couple of very good reasons for that, a number of very good reasons, in fact. Uh, one of them is it's less bandwidth hungry. So obviously for um, uh, uh, communication to space, it, it's helpful to be less bandwidth hungry. You can send that message very quickly and easily. Um, the other thing, though, is that as the conversations build up, we're all very good um, at skim reading and picking up nuances um, and reminding ourselves of what's been said. Um, so if I'm looking at, um, Drew and I have done this many, many times in demos, and things like, as those conversations develop, the carousel rotates and you've gone from topic A to topic B, which does feel natural when you're in a braiding session. It feels very natural. And what you do is you just quickly skim read what's up there before, and then you've got all of the meaning that you had before, and you're very naturally straight into your uh, response to the latest utterance. If that's a series of audio files, you can't do the same. You've got to, or video files, you can't do the same. You've got to, you know, if, if we've got a braid that's rotating, all the timings can be changed. But if the carousel is rotating, I've got, say, two minutes per braid. If I have to listen to an audio file, I can only listen to one minute of audio and then talk for one minute. Now, we have already tested it with headsets so we can do um, speech to text, that kind of thing. And that's certainly going to be something we'll do. Um, we also think for space braiding, we're probably going to have some of the braids carrying a lot of different things over time. So one of the scenarios is an astronaut uh, might be on that mission and, and he or she might have, say, a brother or sister on Earth with whom they're very close. And the way they normally spend time is they go to the coffee shop and they play chess and they talk about the world. They can't do that when they're in Mars or on the way to Mars. So maybe one of those braids can carry a chess game. So it doesn't always have to be tight. We haven't built that yet we designed it but not built it um, so it's the same thing with audio and video some people might prefer audio and video over time that's one of the things we want to to test it may be possible for the first message to be audio related to be audio and then have it transcribed to text later on um, thank you thank you i have um, i see on the chat uh, it's more than a question it's more a comment than a question coming from andy from uh, ses company uh, he's thanking you for your, your talk. Um, and he said, um, I've worked on a deep space robotic mission. So certainly strikes a chord, uh, even without remote human interaction included. I can also see the potential for corporate usage. Example, for, for instance, as an example, global interactions with time differences. And another fellow, um, Young, um, Yuan Young, thank you. This was very interesting. I can see there is so much linguistic and cybernetics elements tied into your uh, underlying product theory. Uh, I'm from an anthropology background. This is really refreshing. So more two comments, more than questions. Fantastic. Thank you. For but uh, I believe comments to the point. Um, so, I mean, we have just a few more minutes to go, if there is... Uh, so uh, one, one more question just yes. appeared from, um, from oh, Martin sorry. asking if there's anything published. Uh, nothing's yeah. published yet. This is all quite... So the, the, the first studies are underway. Um, we obviously hope it will be published in the future, but at the moment, no, no nothing about radio communications is yet published. Okay, thank you. I couldn't find anything just wanted to show up. No, it's, it's, yeah. it, it's too new. <laughs> and when it is published, it'll be your colleagues that publish first. Thank you. Okay, any other question? Um, am I, I'm, yes, I, 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 I'm speaking for a last, I'm in a really a last, it's, it's, it's partly a question, but partly a comment. Um, I mean, th first thing, thank you very much. It's been really quite a, a, a very stimulating and interesting um, um, uh, uh, presentation, which uh, I really wish you very, very well in this. It's, 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 it's an exciting uh, thing to do. Um, it's mm -hmm. about, it's about how it changes the way we might communicate really i mean it's it's the way the way we structure the way we talk to each other when when there's the presence of this latency um 
and uh, I'm wondering if you how much how much you've thought about. For instance, the thing that occurred to me is we could be giving this talk with a 30 minute latency. And we might not really notice that, apart from this conversation I'm having now. But my questions could be related to things I saw that you gave 30 minutes ago. And mm -hmm. if the talk was structured in the correct way, no one would really notice that. Absolutely. That's a really interesting point, Alan. So I mentioned in the sort of the entrepreneurial part, we've taken space braiding, we built braided meetings for a number of reasons. We saw the use case because of our different personality types. We saw the use case because of my personal experience in the market. There are a number of other ideas that we've had that we haven't yet taken to market because we don't know enough about them. So we don't want to go playing in areas where we're not yet experts when we're a small company. One of them is pretty much what you just said. It's talking about, so, uh, you know, yeah, if, you're, if you're delivering um, a lecture or a talk to, um, uh, say, say you're trying to deliver a, a talk to seven or eight different students about something or, or some kind of tutorial session, they've all got different questions. You know, you could have the carousel rotating. Each of them could have their own braid. You can answer one in turn. So they could be asking you about, one could be asking about topic X, one about topic Y. You get your answer to me about topic X and I've got time to think about it and do a follow-up question, by which time the carousel is rotated and you've had the chance to talk to someone else about another topic. So there are a number of applications in areas like um, uh, like education and training that we see. And over time, we're, we're pretty excited by the opportunity to build them, um, but they all come further down the line in terms of our ability as a company to cope with that level of diversity in the product set. Thank you. Thank you. So if there is no other question, I think we're going to leave it here. I want to thank you again, uh, uh, Rob, for your extremely uh, stimulating uh, talk. I think we learned a lot and there's a lot of food for thought. Wish you all the best in this uh, absolutely uh, new endeavor and extremely innovative in endeavor. I think we will follow track on that because it's really, I mean, exciting to see how this is going to unwind. So again, many thank thanks you. for your contribution and thank you for answering so uh, well, thank um, you so much for the chance to talk. It's, uh, it's been great to meet you all. So thank you very much. And uh, all the, 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 I mean, how you answer the questions uh, in a very uh, say, understandable way. Thanks a lot. And I want to also, uh, before closing, uh, indicate to the remaining audience and just let know and spread the word that we have our next lecture on uh, um, the 15th of March, the Tuesday 15th of March. And this lecture will be related to some activities which are taking place uh, or has been taking place on the space station related to plants on the space station. So all the best. Have a nice, a nice week. And thanks a lot for your contribution and participation. Thank you.